All righty, Doc here from North America. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Monday, TGIM. Thank goodness it's Monday. <laughs> Indeed, and just to write off, you can see the dollar is, uh, well, you can see the dollar is a little weak against the Swiss this morning, but we're seeing uh, strong against other places, and it all seems to have some connection to the inflation concept, the inflation talk, the inflation, inflation, however you want to describe it. We saw where uh, copper took a nosedive, uh, and our bond market went up like as if interest rates are dropping. You know, like there's no inflation. And we've been talking about copper and, um, and uh, uh, the bonds and how it seems like, you know, copper was kind of tied to the inflation scare. And I'm hearing this morning... There's people at the Federal Reserve again now saying, you know, we don't need to rush into raising rates in March. <laughs> I just, I think I just have to give you that little laugh instead. I, I don't, I don't, uh, at this point in time, it, it's just like, like no, no responsibility whatsoever. I mean, Bank of England is acting what I think is responsible, raising rates. You know, just the rates are so low, you know, are they going to do the mistake that Turkey did for years, not coming up with that free put concept that they had when the, when the dollar Turkish lira was trading at six, it had to go to eighteen, was super super inflation, and they 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 came up with a clean strategy in two thousand eighteen going into nineteen, and they never implemented it, and they watched their inflation explode, and is and now now Turkey's doing the responsible thing and has calmed down their currency and, and stalled out the, the hyperinflation for the time being, which I think looks pretty good overall what the Turkey's done. And what do we see here now? We see the Federal Reserve here in the States doing like the opposite. Like, oh, I don't know if we need to, to do it. You know, it's like, what? What do you mean you don't need to do it? We're, right now we're running at 7.5% inflation. It's like interest rates are almost at zero. Just raise them a couple of percentage points, two or three, just to show us that you, you actually are coherent to the fact that we have all this inflation going on and uh, people are concerned. So, uh, you know, we look at it here today and we just shake our heads and go, are you kidding me? You know, we've gone from in December thinking they were going to go a half a point somewhere. Bank of England does it, does a quarter point. We think in January they're going to do a quick half percentage point. It's like, you know, we're all concerned again. And they, the Bank of England does it, and we're doing nothing again. And here we are now going into February, and in between the emergency meeting, to, or, you know, a pot potential emergency meeting, or not, you know, waiting for the next late February, I guess, early March. There's talk of maybe the March increase. You know, it's like now they're, the Federal Reserve is talking like maybe they don't need to do it in March. So, we, you know, it just, it just has everything twisted, you know, in the fundamental way. And then you go and watch copper take that smack, you know, bang. You know, and the bonds take off like, oh, we don't have inflation. And the interest rates drop. They didn't rise. They dropped. It's like none of it makes any sense. So anyway, you can see here. Uh, this morning on uh, Chicago Quant, you see it right there. The, uh, the the candle is going down. Let's widen it out a little bit. You see the candle. Yeah, it's dollar is kind of quiet, really. I guess you could say, and it's just moving down a little bit. Look how tight this thing is getting. We're still in that weekly buy. That pressure is still there. At the same time, you can see same thing situation here. You know, it's trying to turn down, just like Chicago Quant is doing. Uh, you got a little red hinky ashy right there. Um, you know. It, it sure does make you scratch your head. It really does. Oh, let me go to the chat line, see if anybody's on the chat line this morning. I forgot to turn that on. Let's check, turn on the chat line. Right there. And right there. And, oh, yes, there we go. There's Janos. Hey, Janos. Hello, Robin. Hey, Jordan. And Martin, hello all. Uh, I'm just perplexed by the strangest of strange, you know. And let me just show you what I'm talking about with this copper 
and the um, metals market. Here is the 30-year uh, right there. And you can see it's lifting up, right? And when this rises, interest rates are going down. Not the most logical thing to an inflationary period. And then vice versa, uh, look at the copper. The copper took it right on the chin in the same way. And, you know, it, we saw the connection between copper and inflation. You know, we've been looking at this chart now for a week or so and just saying, wow, you know, I mean, look how stable it is in the $4 area. Are we really ever going to see below 375 again? And, you know, we start to, at least I start to become convinced that copper is a, like a beacon of inflation. And then they go and they slam it on Friday. And at the same time, what do they do? They slam the bonds at the same time. They take them up in the middle of this inflation scare. And it's like, wow, yeah, we're right. The copper is some type of beacon to the inflation. And the cuckoos at the Federal Reserve just refuse to do anything about it. So, you know, I'm just, uh, I am perplexed. You know, I'm just perplexed to, to see this type of action go on. And you have to really wonder, uh, you know, uh, what kind of, who's in charge there? That's a, uh, I'm, I don't know. What, I'm just totally perplexed from it all. It just doesn't make any sense. And then you throw the, the exchequer into it, the Bank of England, and they're raising the rates. They realize this issue. At least somewhere along the line, we got somebody responsible. Even Christine Lagarde of the ECB said that she needs a. She's looking for a consensus now to raise some type of rate. Now, when when you really look at this stuff, I mean, I grew up in the era of, you know, I was a member at the exchange and we saw interest rates at twenty one percent. Inflation was cruising around at fourteen and a half, fifteen. Um, you know, where is that level of responsibility? I just don't see it. And it's very uh, odd about the whole thing. Anyway, that's where we stand. Uh, nobody's in charge. Exactly, Yannis. It, it feels like, well, you know what it really feels like? It feels like that, that nobody's in charge. But more than that is it feels like nobody wants to be responsible. That's the weird part. We know that Powell is in charge. We know Biden is in charge or his cobble of his organization is in charge. The question more is, What's, uh, you know, where is the level of taking responsibility? That's what it really comes down to. So when you say that there's nobody in charge, it's like they don't want to take any responsibility out of all this. We all are just blindly running through a forest which is on fire. Yes, exactly. Remember the comedian um, Robin Williams? You know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the funny guy, Robin Williams, who's passed on now. He, he, uh, committed suicide, I think. He had some type of disease, and he didn't want to wait it out. He just, you know, jumped off. And he used to say, it's like riding a wild horse through a barn that's on fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. We do move forward. You know, we hit a tree. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I totally agree with you. And it, but I, what I really see is I think you said it best, nobody in charge. And I just changed that word to responsible. No one wants to be responsible. And the problem is the Federal Reserve, that's their job, to fight inflation and to be responsible. And they seem to want to run from the responsibility. And it's just a very strange occurrence to watch. You know, it's just very strange. Then you look here, I got the March 30 bonds up. And they're, they're taking them up. It's like someone forgot to tell the market we got inflation. It is truly one of the stranger events I've ever seen. Uh, I've seen a lot of strange things over the years. All right, let's jump back to the currencies. Let's take a look at the euro this morning. Let's get over to that mouse right there. There we are. And let's put the euro up there. Put it up on J4X. And they've been pressing on the euro. I think it went into the weekly sell on that Friday. You can see that there. It's heading down. Uh, let's put it up over here. There's the euro. Closed in the weekly sell right there. Um, let's put that line in there. There it is right there. And you can see that the pressure is on it. 
you see it's trying to play the opposite side of the the 50 percentile line. You know, I'm, I kept on thinking it wants to go up, but look at it, bangs up against it there. Oh, no, don't, don't grab that. Put that back where it belongs right there. Uh, it bangs up right there. It really bangs up hard there. Bangs up hard there. Did it again there, and they keep on trying to roll over. Uh, well, the bonds, I can explain. Most inflow there is from abroad. Is that what that is? And they're willing to pay. Is there la that much lack of confidence in, in investing globally that they're willing to, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, pay to be invested in those bonds? You know what I mean? Is that the strangest thing or what? Uh, you know, it's just to me, it just uh, shakes. I, I go back to shake my head. I, I don't, I guess, yeah, you know, if people are going to throw money at you, you're going to take it. <laughs> That's what it really comes down to, isn't it? If they're going to throw free money at you, then the ECB will take it. And not only that, but the ECB is getting paid to have that money thrown at them. They're getting paid by the foreigners. The, the, I guess it shows you how lack of, of uh, quality of investment are around the planet. In Europe, pensions, funds, risk plans, yeah. And a lot of other people have moved from 100% index pensions to 75 to 100. And the 25% in equities, yeah, it makes sense. It is better to lose 5% on inflation than the 30% in stocks. Nope, I hear you. I really do. And then throw on top of it the crazy American institution uh, with, uh, you know, with the Federal Reserve and, uh, and the Securities Exchange Commission and Mr. Biden's people. And you really want to dodge the bullet, don't you? You want to put a fire. Europe is like the firewall. You know, don't buy it in the United States. Europe buys it from the United States. And the world buys it from Europe. It's like a firewall on top of a firewall. Uh, when the law obliges everyone to pay in 6% of wages into pension funds. Yeah, yeah. so the cash is just sitting there. It's got to be done. Two, the law also sets where the money is put in and how. And three, you cannot get out until retirement age. Yeah, they've got, a, what do they call that? A, a, a captive audience. That's what we used to call that, a captive audience in trading. So instead of forcing people to save, it's, it is forcing 6% of all wages to lose buying power. We have the same thing here. You know that the, the uh, Social Security is only allowed to invest in 30 and 90 day money. Can you imagine if, they, if people in our Social Security, our pension, if we could have invested in 30 year bonds, we would have three times the amount of money in our pensions three times but instead we're only the social security investment fund here in the United States is only allowed to park the money in 30 day up to 90 day that's it and so that means that most of the time we're paying to be invested also i hate that law and the funds so much i usually go into rant when someone mentions them Oh, no, I do the same thing. Giannis, we're like brothers from another mother, you know, because I agree with you. I do the same thing. I find it insane. In addition, fund managers know that they will pay in no matter what, so they don't bother making money uh, more than the minimum. They make enough to cover their commission and then make almost nothing above it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a real conundrum when it comes to the honesty of uh, the central banks and the governments and retirements. And when I tell people here in the States, they're, in, they're stunned. They, they go, I don't know what you're talking about. I go, imagine if, if Social Security was allowed to invest in 30-year bonds. And they go, well, aren't they? It's like, no. Well, what are they allowed to invest in? Only 30-day up to 90-day. So in other words, to a great extent, at zero, if not minus. Because most of our uh, our 30-day T-bills have been minus more than they've been plus over the last uh, over the last uh, you know uh, 13 years. So there are times where 
our social security is doing the same identical thing. It's actually paying to be invested. So it's not making any money whatsoever. All right, Robin, I hear you there. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real conundrum there. And then you go and look at the, uh, the action. We've seen how the, uh, how the currency pairs are locked in that range I keep on talking about day in and day out now for years here. And, and we've, we even Fibonacci, we've Fibonacci the range. It's so obvious and so clear that it exists. And, and the lack of responsibility. I guess, I, you know what it was? It was like, do you remember, Giannis, when, uh, when was it, uh, Cyprus uh, you know, started to charge bank accounts uh, you know, uh, and turned savings accounts into stock and handed the, the, the savers stock and said, you know, uh, you're only allowed to sell X amount of stock a month. I mean, they forced borrowing. I mean, it's, and it's amazing that it goes on and on and on, and no one seems to want to stop it. Uh, I, I, I think we're, we're past that point at this, at this point. I think we do have people that want to stop it, and they're going to stop it. I, I can see it stopping over the next two or three years. I really do. Um, I, I, I think that we're going to, the adults are coming back to the government and responsibility. And I think that's really, yeah, yeah, just stole the money. I tell people about that. They, they, they like, what? <laughs> They're like, I don't understand. It's like, what do you mean you don't understand? <laughs> this is what they did. How? How can they do that? It's easy. They did it. They did it, and they're not turn it changing. Yeah. Very few of us remember all the little games that are played, you know, and, uh, you know, myself, you, and others, you know, that uh, do remember, you know, when we tell the public what's going on, they go, nah. I remember I told you about that. I was at the swimming event with a history teacher. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a homeschool thing back when I was living up in Princeton. And, uh, and, the, and the history teacher who was head of the history department said, I told, he said, I heard something about minus interest rates. How can they do that? And I said, they're doing it in Europe now. And he said, oh, no, no way they're doing that. And I said, yeah. But how, he says, well, explain to me. How can they do it? I said, easy. They, they, you buy bonds from their, their central bank, and they don't pay interest. You pay them interest. He says, oh, no, no, that'll never happen. I said, it's been going on for like three years. And you know, these are people you know, allegedly teaching history, and they're not even looking at history. It is insane. So, anyway, there's the euro. You can see the, uh, the, the action we're seeing in that, which says in, and you know what? Notice another thing. Let me go back to the Swiss real quick. I'm just going to do it on Chicago Quant here because it'll it emphasize the difference between uh, euro and Swiss. Over on uh, J4X, we have the uh, euro still in it. It's going down. Now, when the Swiss is going down, like right here, over on uh, Chicago Quant, uh, that means that it's gaining value against the dollar. So over on J4X, I have the euro up on there, and it's showing you that, it, that the euro is losing value against the dollar, and the Swiss is gaining value against the dollar. And, and I noticed that with the copper and with the bonds. I noticed when, when, uh, when there's confidence in uh, the, uh, the inflation factor, they start to, or at a lack of confidence in the dollar, a lack of confidence, that's why you see the euro uh, uh, acting the way it is. But at the same time, you know, they're, they, they're, they're losing confidence in the euro at the same time. And so here you can see they're losing confidence in the dollar, in the Swiss, which says to me, flight to safety. It reminds me of the flight to safety uh, uh, characteristic. So in other words, uh, where can you run when you're not buying dollars? And that is obviously the Swiss franc. And so in the end, the dollar is the, the main theme. But I notice at times you see these little characteristics like this, where uh, the lack of confidence uh, in dollar 
sticks out. And it just shows you, like, okay, right now, there's more confidence in Swiss than there is in dollar. Uh, but then there's even less confidence in Euro. Because you see it over there on J4X, it's going down against the dollar. But at the same time, the dollar is also going down against the Swiss, which is the only, as far as I can tell. I mean, I guess you could say you could go over to gold, too. Let's go to gold and just put that back up there again. We'll put that on Chicago Quant just to emphasize the action again. And there is gold. And you know, gold is down a little bit from that pop they got on Friday. But it's still pretty firm in here. Uh, we are flirting with the weekly sell again. And so they go into the weekly buy last week. And here they are already, right off the bat. Uh, let's check out silver, since we were kind of looking at the, that complex. You see now silver is the opposite. It's holding up, which is the copper, right? You know, in other words, we think of silver and copper together. And then let's go look at copper, and copper is falling down. I, I've never seen such inconsistency across the same type of products. It just shows you that channel... It's, it, it takes me back to this. It takes me back to the channel of the, the currency pairs. And it says, hey, we're just rotating. Now, you know, that's what we used to call it on the trading floor. In other words, they rotate into this, then they rotate into that, then they rotate into something else, and it just rotates and it moves around like in a circle. So, it, you know, that's what basically a channel or an envelope is with these pairs trades. And so, in essence, we're seeing the same thing across the spectrum. You know, copper now is down, silver is up, gold is down a little bit, uh, bonds are, are flat to up over the last two days. In other words, they're just rotating. Money's just moving in circles at this point. Just like you said, they just do enough to pay for commissions, but not enough to really turn a profit. Uh, let's see. Uh, SNB want the uh, Swiss down, yeah, the Swiss National Bank. Yeah, that would make sense. They could start once again manipulating the currency if there is too much of an inflow. Now, notice what they do, though. They come up to the top of that end of that range, and then they knock it down. And then now it's it's trapped in this area here, the 50 percentile. So I, I agree with you there, uh, but it seems like they have control. They they're doing what they they want is keep it in a, in that range. I think that's where the real manipulation is is keeping it in that range for the inflows. I believe that the value yes, because let me just say something about as you said there about the inflows. We've noticed when inflows really increase, they really the cent, uh, the SMB does shift. I believe that the value stocks will get the inflows. Yeah, they do reach for them, too. Uh, on Friday, a, as tech dropped 2.5% plus or minus, value stocks lost only half a percentage point. Yeah. Yeah, I think what it really comes down to in the end is everything is trapped. And, and you know, I, I've been hearing people, you know, they're, they're talking stuff, you know, like, oh, you know, uh, you know, the maybe we don't raise rates in March type of thing. But at the same time, the uh, matter of fact, as you say that, the stock market here in the States has lifted pretty well. Dow Jones Industrial Average, let me just go over and show you that. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is right here, is down only 23 points. The low today you know, from last night was 34,249, basically 250. We're a hundred and you can see it's there. It's trading now at thirty-four thousand six oh five. We are three hundred and fifty points off its low. And you can see here, uh, matter of fact, there no more than two hours an hour ago, not even an hour ago, we were trading in the in the thirty-four three forty-three area. Okay. Uh, well, I guess the 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 European open, let's scrunch it up. Let's go to the European Open right there. There's the European Open from Asia, right? They sell it down in the European hours for the first half hour, and they go down from 34,700 and change down, you know, drop. they drop over 400 points on the Dow. So the Asian perked it up, and the Europe knocks it down, and you can see it makes its low here after the first hour and a half of trading. 
you know, it's like a 500 point swing, basically, or 400, at least a 400 point swing, and it bottoms out there. And you can see now, they, they got it back up to the 3700 area and stalled out. You see, we went into our daily sell thing there. So yeah, you're right. The the quality stocks, they're re they're reaching up for them. They are reaching up for them. And uh, it is probably you know in so many ways because if they're not going to raise rates, then then uh, they're going to plow the money back into the the uh, the big tech companies, and the uh, and the quality uh, uh, stocks basically. And that makes total sense. All right, from there, you can see it here too. It's only it's a the Nasdaq. Here's the Nasdaq from the European hours right there. So they knocked the Nasdaq down as soon as they opened up the European market, and it fell down from uh, fourteen thousand three hundred basically to fourteen thousand. What I said it was fourteen thousand three hundred, down to fourteen thousand, almost flat fourteen zero three one, right there three one yeah right there, so it dropped almost three hundred points, which is even a higher percentage drop, and then it bottomed out. So you see that last you know the, the, the little buys have been really good there. Where's the dot sign? And then uh, you can see the sell was right there, and now they're doing it again. They're trying to lift it back up again and go after the highs. Uh, yeah, it, this is uh, this is a very controlled game, very controlled. If they if they hike, let's see, if uh, they don't hike, Biden and Democrats lose election. Yeah, oh, well, they're going to lose the election either way. But but if they hike, they bleed the, the middle class. It is about who suffer uh, who suffers, the poor or the middle class. Either way, Democrats are done for. I know. I've never. I believe what I'm seeing now. We're uh, we're only a month away from the primaries now, from the primary elections, and we're going to see uh, numbers that we've not seen since the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s. 1860s. So 160 uh, years later, the Republicans are going to get the same amount of power they had from the 1860s. That's how big it's going to be. Wouldn't surprise me if we pick up 75, 80 seats easily. 75, 80 seats. We'll have a veto-proof House where they can supersede the president on every turn. That's how it looks to me. And they are caught between a rock and a hard place. I think what it's really come down to is that the, the game is up finally. They've been finally caught. Population has seen what they've done. And the numbers... Matter of fact, uh, there's there's talk this morning. Sixty six percent of the Democrats want Hillary Qu uh, Hillary Clinton investigated. That's that's a monster number. Sixty six percent. That's two out of three want Hillary Clinton investigated. They want her to go to jail. They, uh, they the people here have had it with her. I would like legislation passed that would finally penalize Pelosi for all the insider trading she has done. She's going to run. She's going to run away. She, I don't think she's going to. I think that when, when the House gets wiped out in November, I think she's going to de uh, declare her uh, retirement. I really do. I think that uh, she may stick around for a few months into it and then declare the retirement just to get a flavor. But they've, they've you know, they got, she got into office. They were worth nothing, right? Nothing. Now they're worth over a quarter billion dollars, her and her husband. So, you know, I mean, I've seen all kinds of numbers, uh, uh, you know, that have, and, and you know, she, they trade insider. I mean, he's a big option trader. He's a monster option trader. So, I mean, they're definitely squeezing every dime they can get out of this thing. Yeah, there's a lot of politicians that need to be... Uh, uh, basically taken to the woodshed, as we would say right here. All right, uh, from there, let's see, let's take a look at the British pound, see what they're doing with the British pound this morning. I see that they they, they were pushing it into the cell. Let's do this. It's not there, right there, there it is. There's the British pound. 
you know, they're, they're flirting with the sell, and they can't get it into the buy. And you would think it would climb into the buy just because of the way they're raising rates for the last three months. They've raised rates twice. You would think that, but uh, it seems like it's very comfortable. Look at all this, uh, this last almost month and a half now, almost two-month period uh, since the end of Christmas. Look how they feel very comfortable just being trapped in this really tight range between the 0.23 and the 0.50. I mean, that's really tightening up. Look at that. So maybe that's a higher low. What we're seeing in the pound is a higher low developing. I see that she is sticking around for uh, too long. She doesn't look like having much time left to spend the money. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're looking at uh, a house on Jupiter, uh, the island, you know, where all the money is uh, in Florida. I say that, you know, the, some of the wealthiest people in the world live on Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter Island, right off of uh, Miami and all that. And uh, they're looking at a house there. I think they're looking at like a $22 million house or something like that. So she's probably going to she's gonna move out of California, save her taxes, save the tax money, and live the next 10 or 15 years or five years or whatever it is in Florida, the state that she supposedly hates. And she should have started enjoying retirement at least 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, I, well, she didn't need to do that, but she could have retired, say, 10 years ago or five years ago with over 100 million. She had, they had over 100 million uh, 10 years ago. Like about a hundred. I, last I, you know, I remember ten, eight, you know, something like eight or nine years ago, she had 127 million. I remember that. It was 127 million. Now they have, you know, uh, allegedly they have something like 197 in cash, and they have a bank. <clears throat> they have a bank. They own banks out in California, so they have a a banking group. Her husband owns a banking group. And uh, they, they started off with one bank, and now they have five or six or seven banks in the San Francisco area. So they're, they're worth, you know, when you look at the, the two put together, worth a lot of money. <laughs> I don't think she'll be able to get away with that. But uh, uh, actually, I don't think they can get away with much anymore. No one's willing to do anything. It's election. You know, Politicians are not fast to make, uh, the Democrats in particular, are not fast to make any moves in an election year. Uh, and, the, and the primaries come up in the next you know, four weeks and five weeks. They start off in March and they run all the way to June. And some of them will go all the way as late as August uh, out of the 50 states. Because all the congressional people are up for, uh, the House of Representatives, all are up for election. And that's where I think that's where the that's who writes the checks, that's where the money's made, and uh, and you know uh, decided how to spend. That's why House they're they're elected every two years, and it'll have some effect. There's no doubt about that. And I don't think twenty million means much to her. She'd probably get it as a gift. You know, her uh, she'll stay in office a little bit longer. They'll they'll pay for her house, <laughs> the lobbyist, and then. Then she'll uh, retire. All right. Uh, so there you go. You can see that uh, the uh, cable is doing its thing. Now let's jump over to Turkish Lira. Would you believe, Janos, we're looking at a product, the Turkish Lira, that's actually the more responsible currency now? After all these years of really poor uh, decision making, the uh, Turkish Lira has become like, uh, <laughs> it's really become a good product. Those free puts really make things uh, stable. Look at that. I got that rectangle set up just to show you how much it's not going to go anywhere. That rectangle. Remember every time I see that, that characteristic, I throw the rectangle in? We put that rectangle in around here. I guess it was like in this area. Look at it. It's doubled now. It's going to stay that way a long while. I'll just extend it again like that. I, I don't see any real change. It's just going to fill in all the way across. And let's see what it looks like on J4X there. The dollar Turkish lira, right? There's that right there. And as you can see on 
on the J4X. Same thing. Nice sideways range. Down at the bottom end of the range, but you know, this is going to tighten up. That's going to tighten up on the on the Chicago Quant stuff. They're, they're going to get really tight, and I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they've those free puts make total sense. It's a heck of imagine they they ate through their sovereign fund. They, no, I think first they went through. They ate through their central bank reserves. That's gone. Then they ate through the sovereign fund. That's gone. And then uh, then they started to eat through what reserves had built up again in the uh, in the uh, uh, central bank. And then they remember then they borrowed and faked the books. Remember that on the uh, they faked the amount of money they had in this in the uh, in the central bank. <clears throat> Do you remember that? And then from there, uh, they borrowed against the central bank. Uh, and then people found out that they, they didn't have the money in there that they claimed that they were borrowing against. But now all they do is, all they have to do is raise a little taxes once in a while. And, and you know what I like about it? As much as you and I right from the first day thought, Oh, this won't last, you know, but with it, uh, they, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, that was the last shoe to drop was, um, the central bank borrowed against reserves that capital was in. And I think, remember the guy took off with the bitcoins inside there. <coughs> so the central bank was holding bitcoins or something like that for private customers. And remember the, the, the head took off. And took the bitcoins with them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, they're all they've all been doing it. And so now I think this is a this is legitimately a really solid strategy. You give out free puts and that forces money to stay invested in your in your currency. You know, whatever country it is, you have out free puts and you don't have to bankrupt your sovereign fund. You don't have to bankrupt your central bank. You just raise taxes a little bit here and there. But remember, because the money is staying in the country, because you're giving free puts out, then what happens is investment starts to grow and they can afford the taxation. <laughs> it's like the accountant who offers services is using a boat. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. That's funny. But yeah, so I mean, I think this free put concept is probably a pretty good one compared to, you know, devastating your sovereign funds and devastating your the central bank's reserves and all that stuff. Instead, you keep the cash. It's, it's still there. I just don't understand why they didn't start it when it was at 6%. Uh, no, uh, not 6%. That, uh, the, the Turkish, they came up with a strategy when the Turkish lira was at six to the dollar. And they didn't implement it until it got to 18. And I'm, I'm, I, would, I would have to believe that they have to be impressed how well it's working. At least I, to me on the out, you know, watching it from afar, it looks like it's doing a fine job, you know. Let's take a look at the Turkish lira against the euro now. Right, right there. And there it is on J4X. You can see the Manhattan strategy is, you know, bending down to its low end of the range. You see here on Chicago Quant, you know, just dead quiet, just like it is on, you know, J4X right there. And a little pressure on it right here on the weekly. Uh, I, I really don't see this currency going anywhere. Uh, well, they don't because the guy with the boat was in Greece. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, that Cyprus thing is a real freak out. That's, that's for sure. And it took, what, uh, capital from, wasn't that like a popular place from uh, the Russian Federation to invest also? So you had all those you know different things. Joke aside, could be that the, the the GS advisors that helped the pigs were not hired to evaluate Turkish lira. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the pigs. 
Yeah. Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Exactly. Well, look at the, you know, look at the, you know, look at, look at the popularity of Draghi in Italy. They hate him. I mean, what he did to Italy's banking system, he just beat the daylights out of that. You know, when he was head of the ECB, he abused them. Hence why he didn't become president. They, they made sure he didn't get, you know, put in as the president of Italy. I mean, he, he got, you know, he has the, you know, the, how that, that, the parliament is, you know, the parliamentary system. So he got, a, got away with being head of the parliament, but there's no way they were going to make him president. Uh, let's see. And I bet a lot of people don't even remember the pigs, you know. Uh, I don't there was, you know, that was Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. You know, the southern southern European countries were really in, in a tough situation. Yeah, he did a good job at it, but he, uh, you know, I mean, he did it, he did it much better than the, the, the Federal Reserve did, I think, in many ways. I thought, you know, he spent less money. Yeah, it, it did. Stable volatility, I agree. It was very stable. Uh, let's see. From there, we go over to Canadian. They got the truckers problem over there in Canada. Uh, that's been really weird to watch from afar. And our truckers are going to get going. And you can see here, the currency is locked in on the opposite side of that range now, up in here. You know, between the 50 percentile and the 100 percentile. And you can see we went into the weekly a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the daily is rejoining the game again on the upside here. So I went into the sell there and back into the buy there. And they just don't want to let it go. I think there's a lot of strange, you know, I, I, you know, Trudeau is a very weak leader. I mean, he has a minority government, so, but his minority is bigger than any of the other groups put together. So, but it's just, it's not the Labor Party anymore. It's the Greens and the uh, Labor Party. So it's, it makes it tougher. Uh, kind of European situation. And then let's take a look at Canadian over here on J4X, right there. And trying to lift up just like we're doing over here. Then uh, let's take a look at that. We looked at the, did we look at the metals? We, let's just take a quick look at metals real quick. Right there. And there's, you know, copper you see pushing down. You see silver pushing up. <laughs> gold pushing down. Oh, no, wait a minute. Now they got gold up again. So gold. Now, is that that's the settlement, I guess. They're using that as a settlement. So it is up for the day. So, and then the weekly is pressing a little bit on the downside right here. So we'll see how that plays itself out. And then let's take a look at platinum real quick. There's April platinum. It's trying to lift back up again. I mean, the metals complex doesn't even represent anymore the inflation factor. That's, I guess, the options market is doing that. All right. From there, we jump over to, because we see the strength in gold, we assume, we'll put it up on J4X first, we're, we're assuming that, that the uh, South African RAND is going down. Looks like it is, but we'll see now. You see they're trying to do a little bounce up, but it, it looks red. It's red, that's for sure. Now let's take a look at it. No, not right there. Go over here. And let's see what they're doing with the South African RAND there. And it's just pressing down from Friday's close, but it's still not taking out Thursday's low yet. We think it wants to go below the 15s, just with the way the metals complex is trying to move up. And then let's take a look at the ruble. I don't, I, yeah, I know so you're in that neighborhood. I mean, I just don't see the Russians doing anything more than what they've done. I think if anything, they need the posture just because of the cuckoo Democrats here in the States. 
I mean, Mr. Mr. Obama and Mrs. Clinton tried to overthrow Putin. So he's probably looking at the, you know, he's got this, Mr. Biden has the same people in charge again. So Mr. Putin must feel the same way again. That's what I figure too, oil money. That's exactly what I figure. I mean, we talked about it when it was in the 70s. And, you know, we've seen uh, North Sea oil now get up to like 95, 96. You know, we've seen uh, West Texas Intermediate get up to 94. I figure that's all it's about. He's just flat. Don't, isn't it true that the army that's bivouacked on the border has to be bivouacked somewhere? So what's the difference if it's bivouacked on the border or bivouacked further in? In other words, they got to, the Russians have got to spend the money to keep the, they didn't, they haven't called up troops, right? You're not seeing reservists being moved up, are you? Isn't it just standing army being moved around? Idiots, I agree. I agree. So it made $64 billion and it cost $48 billion for the defense budget. Exactly. That's the way I see it. I totally agree with you 100%. <laughs> it makes total sense to me. Because they're not reservists. It's not like he's called people up. He's just moved standing army around. That's all. Oh, I think when you have a, a president like Biden and the same people in charge that were in charge when Mr. Obama was around, what else? I would build, I would do that. I would do the same thing. Spend a few billion dollars, build some uh, bases right along the border there. Exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's not like he's bringing reservists up. I mean, what's, you know, so what's the difference if he's moving... If he moves them to St. Petersburg or he moves them to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to the borders of uh, Crimea, what's the difference? It doesn't mean anything, does it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, we know that we don't trust Mr. Biden and his people to make the right decisions. So, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's exactly what you're saying. He's just making money in the oil market. And... The, do you know that now Russia is the second largest producer seller to the United States? <laughs> Russia is the second largest oil seller to the United States now. Yeah, I hear you. And 100,000 battle groups uh, can not take a 40 million... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I I agree with you. If I was Mr. Putin, hell, I'd be building building bases along the borderline. And he knows it. He knows. We all know NATO is not going to fire the first shot. They're not. They're not going to fire the first shot. So what's the difference? If they could, they could have them sitting in bases in St. Petersburg or have them sitting on the Crimea. You know, you sit them on the Crimea, you get higher gas prices, you get higher oil prices, you pay for your military. It's like a free, you know, you got to park them somewhere. <laughs> They've got to be bivouacked somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Well, I saw the foreign minister of the Russian Federation come out and said, no way we're invading. That was the head, the head of the foreign ministry. He came out and said that. He said, well, that's a, he said it was absurd to think that we would go invade. And, and, and I, I, just don't, I don't understand. This is, Biden is in so much trouble. You know, the Democrats are in so much trouble that they got to do this crazy stuff. Right. Right, exactly. He's got to he's got to send it somewhere. Exactly. I've never seen so much incompetence in this in this century, honestly. What to invade? Nah, I I don't think that'd be a legacy for him. I don't see that. I don't see it as a legacy.
I think the legacy is to find a way to outsmart the West and make money and not have to fire a shot. I think that's the legacy. And that KBG, KBG, yeah, KBG, KGB, yeah, KGB major in the end is going to outsmart all those clowns. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just, uh, he was smart then, and, you know, he's smart now. Crazy stuff. All right, uh, where are we at now? Let's jump over to the ruble. You see that ruble? I couldn't believe when I spiked it on Friday. I was like, what are they doing? That's not happening. I thought, oh, my God, that's a great short. It's got to be. I don't care what my math says. <laughs> it's got to be a great short. I mean, really. I mean, that, that thing, you know, the, shorted against the dollar. In other words, it's kind of, I think it's coming back down into these lows here, into 70, 71. Uh, I just, and, you know, I was really surprised they threw the weekly buy back in. But look at it. It's already met, trying to make a threat back to the weekly sell. I, I think that, that that's, that's just a, I, I have not seen so much foolishness of the posturing from the, from the West, you know. Like as if Putin wants to just blow up the neighborhood. It's like, cut me a break. Instead, he can just, they are just so small-minded that Putin can basically dance around them all day long. All right, let's take a look at the yen, which, again, has been catching my eye. It almost went up. It did. It took out the high there. The high there was uh, uh, 116.35. And it got to, uh, I, I actually had, Touched it and stopped. 113, I'm sorry, 116.34. And I'm a little curious about this action. This is a five year high. We haven't seen the, the dollar yen this high in a long time. Matter of fact, of late, I've been relating, I've been, I've been uh, relating to the 39,000 Nikkei, you know, back in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, the 39,000 Nikkei and all the money spending. And then how they lost all that money. You know, they bought properties all around the world and they overpaid. And I'm thinking China's doing the same exact thing right now. China's doing the same exact thing. It's throwing money at everything and very expensively. And, but at the same time, they have no floating currency, so they can get away with it longer than Japan did. Uh, that's the that's the big difference. Without a floating currency, China can pretend that they are uh, stronger. But uh, a, a trader this morning texted me, one of the old guys texted me this morning, and he was saying, like, I can't believe that they let $3 billion default. He says, what's up with them? How do they let, like, 40 and $50 million defaults occur? Uh, I don't understand that. Now a $3 billion default. And I said to them, I said, you know, they don't, they really don't have the money that everybody thinks they do. And they don't have confidence uh, because, you know, in our society, because they know that if their currency floated, it wouldn't be seven won to the dollar. It would be like, you know, 21 won. It would go like the ruble. I mean, I remember when the ruble was four and five to the dollar. And then once it was became a floating currency, next thing you know, it was nine, and from nine to 13, and then 13 to 23, and so forth. Now we're looking at a ruble that trades in the, in the 70s and in the, in the low 80s. And so, you know, they know that if, if they had to actually, you know, be a world power, they don't have the equity to be a world power. I don't see it at all. All right, where do we go from here? The last one will be the Mexican peso. And there is the Mexican peso. And it's been working its way back down again that we talked about, back inside its range uh, after that crazy event with Mr. Uh, Biden right here. Let me get that mouse on there. That big circle represents when they had that meeting Mr. Biden, Canada, and Mexico all together, and uh, it freaked it out, but now it seems to be calmed down and back inside the range again. 
and see what it looks like over in J4X. See dollar, peso, and there. All right, traders. Uh, Ballard is coming out in about two or three minutes. He's going to do a live. Uh, that's the, the the chairman of the uh, or the president of the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve, and uh, he's one of the only adults in the room. He keeps on demanding for a, a price increase in rates. And everybody else dodges it. So this is going to be interesting. So I'm going to get going from there. We will see what happens, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but he's going to be speaking in literally in about three minutes. So this should be very interesting live. Uh, you can see they, let me just take a quick look at the stock markets across the planet, in particular the U.S. ones. Um, you see that? The S&P 500 is up two and a half points. It was down almost 65 points at one point. Dow Jones Industrial Average is up seven points. It was down 350 points. And the NASDAQ 100, or the Tech 100 on Duke Escapi, uh, it is up five points right there. And it was down 300 points. So it's up six points. It was down 300. So big moves. They've been reaching back up for this stuff. All right, traders, catch you tomorrow. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you to all our Dukascopy friends and global traders. Ta-ta for now.